event of IMA Festival, the International Migration Art Festival. I'm one of the organizers, my name is Elena Maria Manzini, and here with me is Rossella Canevari, the other organizer that you'll meet her later. <laughs> um, I just want to make a, a small summary of what's going to happen tonight. At the very beginning, there's going to be uh, screenings of the movies that won the festival, and then we have the possibility to meet the winners of the film and the literature category and uh, um, a representative of our partners, um, Fondazione Cesare Pavese. Then there's going to be uh, a very interesting conference on how a bestseller becomes international, so pretty much a conference about translation with Giorgio Faletti and his date East translator Anthony Sugar. And I would like just to give like the word for two seconds to Stefano Albertini, which is the director of Casa Italiana, that we thank very much for hosting our event. Buonasera, benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everybody to Casa Italiana. Those of you who are our faithful members and those of you who are here for the first time, you're all very, very welcome. It's a great pleasure to have this as a closing event of our season. After this, we go on vacation. <laughs> and, and, and it's, uh, it's great to have this event because it summarizes a variety of interests that the Casa Italiana has cultivated through these last 20 years. So there is uh, literature, there is cinema, there is translation, that is the bridge between different literatures, and of course there is the culture of food. Uh, and another very important topic that is included in the activities of the IMA Festival, of course, is immigration. And one of the um, really strong points of Casa Italiana since its uh, foundation is the emphasis on the Italian-American experience as an experience of immigrants that have become successful and important in this country, but that went through all the troubles of being immigrants. So it's yet another very important point uh, of our mission, and we're very, very grateful that you brought this issue at the forefront of your activities. So without further ado, I think we should start, and then I'm going to say something more when we start our uh, roundtable with the uh, Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the winner of the category of Ima Festival, if you want to sit down. I just want to say a few things uh, about the festival itself, because we didn't say that before. The theme of the festival was food and migration, and we had four categories, uh, film, music, literature, and visual arts. So everybody that wanted to participate in the festival had to send, uh, to upload actually on our website, their works on food and migration. So this is basically like the core of your work. And uh, I would like to talk to you first of all about your um, background. You uh, were born in Spain, but now you live in the States, so you basically represent migration <laughs> yourself. <laughs> and then about this work. You want to say? Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I come from San Francisco. I've been living there for five years. I'm originally from Spain, from Malaga. And I started uh, my career as a copywriter, doing advertising, doing ads uh, for TV and, and, and stuff. And uh, since I came to the US, I started getting involved in filmmaking. Uh, so this is my second piece. Um, and now I'm working on my first uh, feature length uh, movie. Um, I'm liking it so much. I'm starting my own company in San Francisco. I quit my job in, a, in advertising, advertising three months ago to be able to focus in filmmaking, and, and so far so good. So did you move for work reasons? Like you moved to, to San Francisco because you had a job, or you just decided to, you had to move to the States? Uh, when I first came to San Francisco almost eight years ago, I fell in love with the city, and I was working in Madrid in advertising so hard, like, you know, in the wee hours, like so many hours every day and weekends. And I applied for a scholarship, and I got a scholarship, and I was lucky enough to come to the city that I was dreaming about, and I became a student again, starting over from scratch. And after finishing my master's in creativity, I, I got my job in advertising, and meanwhile, you know, I, I worked in filmmaking, and, and that's, that's the main reason I came here. 
And I want to talk um, a little bit about this beautiful piece, Mexican cuisine. We talked about it a little bit yesterday to prepare for this conference and we realized that it has a very subtle message. Some people don't get it the first time. And I want you to say something about the, the message that is behind this film. Yeah, um, well, we think it's a conceptual piece and it was intended to be that way from the very beginning. Uh, the reality we portray is a, it's a, an obvious reality for a lot of people, but it's a subtle, a hidden reality for so many other people. Like, a lot of people don't fully realize that, you know, behind the scenes there are work, you know, workers, Mexican workers working in, in commercial kitchens pretty much everywhere, uh, not only in California, but also in New York, you know, Chicago, Dallas, and so many other cities. So that's a reality that particularly hit me when I first arrived and I decided to make a piece out of that reality. And then we found that connect connection between Mexican cuisine as it is, which is the voiceover you guys can hear, is a voiceover, a Mexican voiceover talking about Mexican cuisine. And those relationships we found with all the commercial kitchens and, and the different cuisines that Mexican cooks work for. And that's when the subtlety comes into place, because if you're not very familiar with, you know, the, 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 the kebab is similar to the taco, and, you know, the pizza is similar to the tortilla in Mexico, you might get lost. But that's, that was the original idea, and, and we decided to make it that way. And that's very interesting. Um, I want to invite on stage also the director of your next movie, Martin Rosette. <laughs> I wrote your name before. And uh, yeah, we really love you to talk about the next job and your projects for the future. Hi, thank you. So yeah, we I came with the same scholarship that Fran. So we met like five years ago, and yeah, I really love his work, and I guess that he liked mine also. So yeah, we decided to start working together. And and I got this call from Francisco like like five years ago almost, and yeah, invited me to be part to direct uh, an idea that he had for a short film, and that was the beginning of the this uh, documentary that we are doing now. We do have a trailer for this uh, documentary that you finished, right? With the uh, almost finished with the work. If you want to help, actually, <laughs> there's a website on which you can help them finishing their work. It's called Moses, and if you want, we can just show it. Thank you, and this was for the part of the film category. Now I would like to introduce Heba Matkur. She's the winner of the literature category. our um, festival this year, it was still about food and migration, what she had to write about. And uh, her piece is called Straniera a casa mia, which means a foreigner in my own home. And I would like to start by reading a piece of her work so we can talk about it. Growing up, you learn to live with this cultural mishmash. You learn to speak mixing the two languages, you learn to choose the values from each culture that best suit you, but most of all, you learn to cook improbable dishes. Yes, because if all goes well, once a week we cook something Egyptian, perhaps with lasagna as a main course. As a child, I was asked the usual odious question, do you prefer Italy or Egypt? And I never knew what to reply. Had it been just for the food, perhaps I would have chosen Italy. But then I would realize that there are certain dishes that you can't find there, and I adore, and I'd be confused again. Now, after many years, I know what I prefer between Italy and Egypt. Both. I am a foreigner, always. Italian in Egypt, and Egyptian in Italy. 
but I love my life exactly for this reason. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> what I can say. Um, uh, first of all, um, uh, I was born in Egypt and I came to Italy when I was two. So I lived in Italy for all my life, <coughs> but we, we are too connected with Egypt because my parents are Egyptian and I feel Egyptian like I feel Italian too. And, um, but when I was a teenager, it was very painful to be to the both Italian and Egyptian because I uh, was living a life in uh, my home that was exactly um, opposite, opposite, opposite in, um, outside with my friends in school. Uh, they tell me something and my home, my parents tell me another thing and uh, it was very painful for me. But um, growing up, I realized that it, it's wonderful to be, um, to have such a, a big culture about Egypt and uh, also to be Italian, so to be um, we say um, Milanese <laughs> because I have an accent, an Italian accent, and um, maybe I, I have just built a, a little bit accent in, in Egyptian too. Um, I think they realize that I'm not uh, living in, in Egypt, but I don't know. Uh, and um, today I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, I'm really happy to be both. Yeah, because in Italy we do have, like you, the second generation of uh, people that were born from families that immigrated into Italy. And you also have a son, which is like the third generation. And uh, you were saying that maybe your son will lose a little bit of the culture coming from. I think, I think the, the third generation will, will lose something. Will lose, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think everything, but... Um, a big part of our culture will, will be lost. And um, the problem, I think, in, in Italy uh, is uh, I, I had my Italian citizenship when I was uh, 27. So I was really big and I lived my life in Italy, so I feel Italian. And there is a lot of people like me in, in Italy that is um, Egyptian or um, Asian or um, from Morocco. Is, um, we are very, very um, a, a big community of second generation. And we, in, in Milan, we are thinking about uh, um, create an association about Egyptian in Italy and uh, me and some friends of mine and uh, I hope uh, it will be a real project in, in next month. Do you work as a, as a writer? Or this was yeah. like uh, no, an experiment? <laughs> a beautiful I wrote experiment. two pieces for a blog in Italy that is uh, Yala and um, write about uh, Arabian um, second generation in Italy. And um, this, is, this was my first public work because I, I always like to, to write, but um, um, it, it was all, um, only for, for myself. So it's a, a huge beginning. <laughs> and now it's time to share. <laughs> So uh, this second piece we chose from uh, her work, it talks about food. <laughs> Despite the fact that the number of Egyptian immigrants in Italy are steadily increasing, Egyptian cuisine is not very well known. The kebab, that in Italy is a sandwich, in Egypt is the population's most coveted dish, grilled meat. Couscous is a Moroccan dish, more than an Egyptian one. We eat it as a dessert with ice and sugar. 
Falafel is called Tamaya and is an integral part of the abundant breakfast of 90% of Egyptian. Above all the cause of the astonished morning expression typical of many Egyptians. I challenge anyone to eat beans early in the morning and then feel light. The best and least known part of Egyptian cuisine is a ritual. Every dish has its rules, both in the creation and the consumption. The molokeya, for example, is prepared in several steps. First, you remove the leaves from the stems. Then, chop them with mezzaluna, and then put them into the broth, usually rabbit. To make a tasty molokeya, the most important ritual to respect comes when adding the hot dressing, made of garlic and spices, to the broth. During this process, you must let out a scream to the consequent concern of those who are in a home and have not noticed that you are cooking. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the, in the piece, you also say that it was very, uh, it's very nice, uh, nice piece. That when you come back, when you and your mom and your family comes back from come back from uh, from Egypt, you bring into your suitcase. A lot of products, and that's what I mean. Like every everyone of us, when we yeah. go back to Italy and we come to the States, we just bring. We try to bring prosciutto <laughs> and formaggio and everything. So yeah. we bring everything. So we 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 go to the security, and we are so terrified because <laughs> if they open our luggage, they will. Uh, first of all, they will throw everything so and um, the next step uh, will be me uh, and my um, humiliation <laughs> yeah um, yeah humiliation okay. uh, um, i think so humiliated <laughs> now we also have the translator <laughs> thank you <laughs> This is my excuse, <laughs> always. And um, this is a part. This is in, in, an interest in a, um, an interesting part because we we bring everything because there is something that uh, um, in Italian we we can find um, and sometimes it's art. <laughs> What is your favorite, apart from what I, I read, but what is your favorite Egyptian dish and your favorite Italian dish? And do you, like, I guess that you mix sometimes, yeah, yeah a lot. Yeah, as, uh, as, I, as you wrote, is, um, it happened that uh, um, my mother cooked lasagna and uh, mm, together with Molochea uh, is uh, the one uh, who in which you, you have to scream, but it's not a, a really scream, it's like, <gasps> and uh, <laughs> you come running and but what why? happened? What, what is the reason behind me? We are very curious I, right now. Oh, I, I asked my mother and she, she told me that uh, it, um, it has to be good. So we have to scream, I don't know. And, um, and, and yeah, we mix a lot. Um, sometimes it's, um, we have mashi that is uh, um, rice rolled in um, veg vegetable, like um, zucchini or something like this. And um, this is so good. So we eat a lot, a lot of mashi in, uh, in Egypt. And we come in Italy and uh, my mother also cook it again so I I, I look at, at, at her and I, say, I just eat a bit in Italy in, in Egypt what what do you make? You can make a lasagna, you can make anything. No 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 I feel the smell of Egypt like uh, this. So it's it's nice. It's true because the way the reason why we put uh, food and migration together, food together with migration is that because it's really important it really like Food and the cuisine really keeps you close to your own land, to your own home. It makes you the smells, the, the tastes, it makes you feel at home. Today happened to me something. So I, I was uh, uh, downtown 
and there was a guy, an Egyptian guy with um, uh, his uh, kebab uh, box out, right? and um, he was cooking the shish kebab and uh, I smelled the, the same uh, um, perfume that I, I, I smell in Egypt, so, so it was uh, nice. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eva. Congratulations. <laughs> to call on stage uh, Pierluigi Vaccanimo, which is the director of Fondazione Cesare Pavese. Actually, in the um, literature category, we did have a special prize that was given by Fondazione Cesare Pavese, and uh, now we organized tonight this event also together with them, and they came from Italy to support us, so we really thank them. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. And you have to do me a favor, because I want to speak about the uh, sensation. Uh, as it speaks uh, to our heart. So uh, for me, uh, I prefer to speak uh, in my own language, okay. my mother language. So because when uh, I speak about the sensation, uh, this sensation comes from my heart. And uh, then uh, my mother language is uh, too much. Okay. You speak very well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it speaks a very good English, but we can call Jason. <laughs> Jason Jenkins is our translator, and he can come and help you. My friend tonight. <laughs> your friend tonight. Thank you, Jason. Well, first yeah. of all, you chose a piece from The Moon and the Bonfire, which is a very important book by Cesare Pavese. The most important book by Cesare Pavese. And we have also a, a good project about The Moon and the Bonfires, and then uh, I speak in the end of the, my, uh, my speech. And, uh, is a new project uh, about uh, Twitter and uh, the Moon and the Bonfires, but uh, we can speak about it uh, later. So, Jason? So, I will read this little piece that you yeah. chose and then we can talk a little bit about Cesare Pavese and his travels and William. I came back to this village and not to Canelli, Barbaresco or Alba, because I had a reason to. I wasn't born here, that's almost certain. I don't know where I was born. Around here, there isn't a house or a piece of land or bones that could make me say, this is what I was before I was born. I don't know whether I come from a hill or a valley, from the hoods or from a house with the balconies. Maybe the woman who left me on the steps of the cathedral at Alba wasn't a country woman at all. Perhaps her people owned a palace. Or perhaps two poor women from Monticello brought me in a grape picker's basket. Or someone from Neve, or why not? Even for Cravanzana. Who knows what flesh I come from? I've traveled enough through the world to know that all flesh is equally good and worth the same. But you get tired of it, and that's why you try to sink your roots into the ground to make a land or a country for yourself, so that your flesh will mean something and last a little longer than just a simple round of the seasons. If this is the village where I grew up, I owe it to Virgilia and Padrino, my foster parents, people who aren't here any longer. They took me in and raised me just because of the monthly payment from the hospital at Alessandria. There were some wretches on these hills 40 years ago who, besides the children they had already, would settle themselves with, bastard, with a bastard child from the hospital just to see a piece of silver. Some took a little girl so they could make a servant of her later and order her around. Virgilia wanted me because she already had two girls and they hoped to settle on a big farm when I was a bit older, where we all worked together and get ahead. Padrino had a cottage on the farm at Gaminella then, two rooms and a stable. There was a goat and a bank of hazelnut trees. I grew up with the girls. We stole one another cornmeal mush and slept on the same straw mattress. Angelina, the eldest, was a year older than me. And it was only by chance that I found out I wasn't her brother. The winter Virgilia died when I was 10. After that winter, sensible little Angelina 
had to stop chasing along the riverbank and through the woods with us. She looked after the house, made the bread and the goat cheese, and went to the town hall herself to draw out my money. I used to brag to Julia that I was worth five years, and I tell her she didn't bring in anything at all. Then I'd ask Padrino why we didn't take in more bastards. Festival every year. We need the actresses. Uh, <laughs> <every> well, <laughs> I come. Don't worry about it. If you want, I know some. Uh, some somebody. Okay. <laughs> Give somebody your music. What did you choose this piece? Because it's the most important part of the moment of fires. Because in this few rig, uh, in this few uh, passage, uh, we can find. Uh, uh, all the things, all the, the sensation important in Pavese novels, because um, you can find um, um, Il Ritorno, the theme of the Ritorno, the, the return theme, because Pavese um, wasn't in, a, in the, he speaks about uh, uh, a man that uh, came in America, in, uh, in California, um, but Pavese non è mai stato in America, non c'è mai stato Pavese in America. Um, quindi per questo lui ha questa voglia uh, di parlare. Jason, my friend. Viva Jason. Il tema importante della loro uniforme è appunto questa voglia di vivere l'America perché l'America per Pavese è sempre stato qualcosa di molto importante. The important theme is for him to have lived this part of America because America for him was a very important theme, a very important part of his life. America a Pavese dà una lingua, dà un uh, modo di pensare, un uh, America gave provided for him a language and a way to think that he didn't previously have. Per gli intellettuali, e questo me lo disse Fernanda Pivani in un'intervista che eh, è stata fatta anni fa eh, a Milano durante una conferenza, eh, la letteratura americana era qualcosa di molto serio e prezioso. With Fernanda Pivano, che è stata allieva di Pavese, è stata una grande importatrice di cultura americana One da Pavese, student who was a big importer of the American culture. Dopo Pavese, oh, prima Pavese, 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 Pavese. obviously. E, mm. Proprio per questo, um, exactly because of this, Pavese cercava nell'America, in quell'epoca, in Italia, in cui ti frego, si diceva il fanciullo raggiunge la dimora. E in America si diceva il bambino va a casa. <laughs> Translate. <laughs> Come on. In America he said uh, the child. Il fanciullo, il bambino va a casa in America. The, the in child it, went home in America. In Italia il fanciullo raggiunge la dimora. And in Italy the... It's a very subtle translation. <laughs> Adesso ti salvo, visto che tu salvi me, io salvo te. Me out, yeah. <ride> e questo significa che appunto in America c'era la libertà di pensiero. E per un intellettuale di inizio secolo che in Italia aveva il fascismo, aveva la retorica, l'annunzio, eh, avere la possibilità di confrontarsi con una letteratura libera. For an Italian brought up with the Uh, restrictions of the rhetoric of a fascist culture and um, the American language gave a freedom that he couldn't previously have at his uh, yes, sicuramente importante è qualcosa di veramente eh, nuovo per, la, per il proprio percorso letterario and so it was a new dimension for his uh, literary uh, path questa pagina che abbiamo letto è tutto quello e il eh, la fine del suo percorso di ricerca Pavese this crea passage, questa lingua this passage represents the uh, almost the end of his literary passage e noi troviamo una lingua che è poesia 
che è romanzo ma che è un metro poetico voi conoscete le foglie d'erba di Walt Whitman you know the uh, um, foglie d'erba which is the grass blades leaves of grass leaves of cr cr grass e Pavese impara da Whitman un metro una lunghezza che è una melodia musica, musicalità e se noi leggiamo l'uno di farò in italiano e noi leggiamo l'uno di farò in inglese ritroviamo questa musicalità If we read Falò in uh, English and we read it in, it in Italian, in the Italian we find a certain musicality which is, which is present, which is you know, obviously difficult to understand. Yeah, since um, later on we're going to be talking about translation and it's very important for Cesare Pavese because it was a, an amazing translator, very famous for his work. And Who translated the, um, the Moon and the Bonfire in English, do you know? Ci sono molti i traduttori, ne parlavamo anche prima, sono diversi traduttori, non tutte le traduzioni sono ottime. There are many different translators and not all of them are necessarily good quality. Ce n'è addirittura una che è la luna e il farò, uno solo. There is only one, the one who only talked about one um, lighthouse instead of bonfire instead of e quindi cambia totalmente la comprensione del romanzo perché parlare di Ifalò significa parlare del mito speaking of just one bonfire is obviously significantly changing the, the story e parlare invece di tanti falò si parla di una, un, un mito un mito, yeah, il mito di, di Pavese cioè il legame profondo di Pavese con la natura e con eh, le tradizioni Speak of more than one bonfire, you, 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 you allude to the myth of, of Pavese. Ma è importante perché Pavese è, stato, è nato come traduttore, quindi il suo primo lavoro è eh, fare il traduttore. Pavese's original uh, work was the work of translator before he was a writer. E lui inizia a tradurre Sinclair Lewis, uh, Sinclair Lewis, uh, Our Mr. Rain. Uh, He began translating Sinclair Lewis on Mr. Wren. Da cui impara una, uno slang. Uh, from which he began to learn his uh, American slang. La sua lingua, quella che diventerà appunto poi la lingua dei suoi romanzi. His, his language, which then became the language of his books. E noi, proprio per questo, la Fondazione Cesare Pavese, che ha sede a Santo Stefano Belbo, un piccolo paese in Piemonte, nella provincia di Cuneo, ma stasera rappresentato da una decina di persone, Exactly because of this, that the, uh, the foundation of Cesare Pavese, which comes from a very small uh, town um, uh, in the north of Italy, which uh, um, coincidentally is represented here this evening, there are about uh, 10 people from this uh, small town of about 4,000 inhabitants. Ci siamo trovati qua. By coincidence, they find themselves here in the audience this evening. Should we say also a few words about the winner of your own uh, special prize? Noi abbiamo scelto appunto il nostro premio, eh, Michael Capozzi, eh, perché era quello che più si avvicinava all'idea di letteratura di Pavese, ovviamente, permettetemi, con le debite proporzioni. We chose Michael as the winner because we felt that he was the one whose um, work was most closely related to uh, or aspired by uh, Cesare Pavese, uh, without obviously belittling the work of Cesare Pavese. Perché la lingua di Pavese è una lingua breve, ironica, sintetica. Because uh, Cesare's language is uh, brief, ironic and synthetic. Um, uh, concise. Però ricca di significati, proprio come il racconto che aveva inviato Michael. Rich in meaning, which is exactly the, the feeling that came from Michael. E creativa. And obviously uh, above all creative. Yes, because maybe we should like explain the story because for most of you it would be impossible to read it since it's only in Italian. But do you want to tell the story a little bit about his work? It's it's really it's really well. Sì, la storia thought. La storia parte dal punto di vista della um, pasta. Quindi, the story starts from the, the point of view of pasta. As a, il protagonista è un um, pezzettino di pasta che the protagonist uh, is a um, a piece of pasta che appunto nasce e si chiede il motivo per cui è nato quindi is born and asks himself the reason as to why what is the reason of his being ed è un pezzettino di pasta scura 
But he is the pastor. He's a dark piece of pastor. E allora questo pone ancora più dubbi sulla propria esistenza. Which obviously brings even more uh, questions about his existence. Ma passando da una cucina all'altra arriva alla cucina di un uh, cuoco americano famoso, bravo, importante. But he comes uh, during his life in the, amongst through the various kitchens that he's that he's in, he comes into the kitchen of an important chef. Che lo legge ha ah, il pezzo di pasta che lui porta in giro per eh, le dimostrazioni di cucina. That chooses him as the official uh, representative piece of pasta that he uses to represent his work. E quindi diventa una star, in so un certo senso. He becomes a star. star. <laughs> e quindi questo essere un pezzo di pasta scuro in realtà diventa qualcosa di bello, importante, che lega profondamente il pezzo di pasta alla propria identità. So being from, starting from a, the, the, uh, being a different piece of pasta to the rest, uh, this difference ends up sort of exalting him to a, a position of um, stardom uh, above the others. Ed è per questo che abbiamo deciso di premiarlo, proprio perché l'ironia con cui ha trattato questo tema della migrazione, della diversità, era in realtà eh, qualcosa che è molto simile a quello che faceva Pavese e quindi molto importante anche per quello che tentiamo di fare noi. So it's that, exactly that sort of irony that was present in Pavese's work, which is, um, you know, we saw present in this work and was why we um, gave him the prize. A questo proposito. And Michael is here with us in spirit. <laughs> è con noi, è con noi. E Michael parteciperà a quello che dicevo prima, essere il nostro progetto, perché ne abbiamo già parlato. Michael will be participating in the project that you mentioned earlier. Proprio perché siamo Pavese era creativo e anche noi siamo creativi, abbiamo pensato di usare Twitter. So we've now, um, because we're uh, in, in an effort to maintain our creativity, we're now looking to use Twitter per riscrivere la luna di falò. To rewrite the, uh, the, the, the moon in the bonfires. Quindi dal 25 di giugno un capitolo, un tweet, fino al 9 di settembre, giorno del compleanno dello scrittore. So from the 25th of June until the um, April, no, no, the night of September, which is the birthday of Cesare Pavese, we'll be uh, using a tweet by tweet, we will recreate the 32 capitoli, 32, 32 chapters, 32 tweets. Non esiste ancora un ebook di Cesare Pavese, esisterà la prima versione in ebook della Luna di Falò riscritta attraverso Twitter. So, uh, an ebook doesn't yet exist, the first uh, electronic version of Cesare Pavese will exist uh, through Twitter rather than in the ebook format. Chi di voi vuole partecipare al nostro account? Don't you that would like to participate and, and view that, the Twitter? Follow us on dot Pavese Cesare, il nostro account su Twitter, dal 25 di giugno. Dot Cesare Pavese. Pavese Cesare. Pavese Cesare. Pavese Cesare. Dal 25 di giugno you find the, il regolamento. From the 25th of June you'll find the uh, rules. The rules of the project on www.fondazionecesarepavese.it www.fondazionecesarepavese.it Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the work. So now it's time for me to leave the stage for the next part of the evening, which is the yeah you can leave that here, thank you. Which is the conference that will be introduced by my colleague Rossella Canevari. Let me say a little thing, she's shy and she won't tell you. But uh, from last Friday, uh, Rosella is also a writer, and her book No Panic is uh, you can buy it on Amazon as an ebook on Barnes and Noble. So please look for it because it's a beautiful book. And finally, you have it also in the states. <laughs> so let me leave the stage to Rosella for introducing this conference, <laughs> which is uh, entitled. That's a, what? Yes. So first maybe. Oh, first maybe. Uh, Mr. Albertini would like to say another few words about the <laughs> I think I've spoken enough, but just uh, I want to welcome uh, you all back if there is any new person. And if you stayed, I think you, you really had a treat, and I had a treat, and I want to congratulate again the winners. 
of both the literature uh, section, Eva Matkur. Uh, Eva, your stories are, are wonderful. Uh, there is uh, so much life in what you tell about your double life, and I think so many Americans of Italian descent can totally relate to the way in which you tell your story. Italians are a nation of immigrants, and many of them came here. And food was actually one of the major ways in which they found a way to negotiate their two identities. Uh, developing what is now known as Italian-American cuisine. So you might be the prophet of Egyptian-Italian cuisine in your own way. And, and as you know, it's in the kitchen and it's in the boiling together of ingredients that we come together also as people. So I congratulate you for, for the great job you did. And uh, of course, I would like to also congratulate uh, Francisco Guijarro. Is Francisco still here? Here. Your film is uh, fantastic. It's the first time I saw it. I want to see it again. Uh, it's it's a piece of poetry in, in images and words, and I think you did an incredible job. And I wish you all the best for your new project that seems uh, even more exciting and deep and, and moving. So congratulations for, for a great job. And, Thank you. and uh, I would like to welcome now the um, the mayor of uh, Santo Stefano Bergo, who's also the president of the Fondazione Cesare Pavese, I was reminding before that my first graduate course in this country when I came to the United States was at the University of Virginia on Cesare Pavese with a Hungarian professor talking about globalization. <laughs> and uh, Professor Vlasic, that I remember very dearly, was one of the major uh, critics of, of Cesare Pavese. And uh, I would like to welcome also, of course, uh, Giorgio Faletti, who is the guest of honor for our evening. Uh, George is one of the uh, best known and best sold authors in Italy. Um, he started as, a, as an actor and a comedian. When he decided to start writing a book, he started publishing a book that sold I believe, almost 4 million copies only in Italy. Uh, his books are now translated into some 25 languages. And uh, when he decided to sing, he made Sanremo. And uh, when he started acting, he, he started in one of my favorite films of the last few years, not the Prima del Gesami. So it doesn't do anything wrong, actually. <laughs> so you might want to also address that. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for Casa Italiana uh, to welcome these uh, wonderful group of guests, along with uh, uh, Anthony Sugar, who is the translator of, of Giorgio here in the United States. And uh, welcome them to the Casa, welcome them to this initiative. And I think now it's time for Rossella, uh, can I get you to tell us something more about uh, the whole thing? Thank you. So, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. I'm Rossella Canevari, a writer and one of the organizers of IMA Festival, International Migration Art Festival, with my colleague Elena Maria Manzini. Uh, first of all, uh, um, I want to thank Mr. Albertini for hosting us here tonight in this beautiful location in New York. We are having the last <coughs> IMA Festival New York events and uh, we are very excited. Before we were in London, uh, after New York we will be, sorry, before we, we were in Milano and after New York we will be in London for the end of the second edition. In October we will open the third edition and uh, next year we will be here hopefully again in this beautiful location so uh, now uh, as a writer and uh, as the organizer of the festival i'm very proud to be part of this literary event a quite difficult but important topic something that in my opinion is not uh, enough debate deba debated but is fundamental for the spread of culture worldwide i'm talking about books and translation writers and translators uh, when you read a book that has been translated from another language, uh, it's important not just to understand but to smell the language, to smell the smells, to, to taste the, fla the flavors. Um, well, of course, this is the work of a good translator. And uh, it's not very easy. It's not easy. It's a tough job. Um, nowadays, not a lot of people like to do this job, a job that in the past was done by the writer themselves, as we know with uh, Cesare Pavese, a very important writer. And um, so tonight we are here to talk about that with the celebrity uh, writer Giorgio Faletti. Please, uh, Giorgio, come, come here. Thank you. Ho 
battuta solo per capire quanti di voi parla, capiscono l'italiano in modo che non fare troppe figure col mio miserabile inglese vabbè, penso se lo parlo io puoi parlare anche tu ok um, I want to just to say uh, 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 Albertini says enough about uh, Faletti but uh, I want to just to say that a pimp's note the last creation of Giorgio Faletti will be available on the books bookstores here in the States, in the old uh, United States, in a few weeks, right? Yes, June 17th. A pimp's note. July, sorry. So from July, right. in the bookshops. With a with time machine, it's possible to have it in June. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? But uh, later on, uh, Giorgio will read a small piece of a pimp's note in Italian for us. And, uh, but now I want to introduce a, another um, very important uh, person of, of, the, of this conference. We are here with the famous translator, Anthony Sugar. Please, Anthony, come. <laughs> it's funny because usually we don't miss the translators, right? So. Um, well, um, aside from Giorgio Faletti's A Pimp's Note, uh, his recent translations include uh, books by Simonetta Agnello Horby, Silvia Vallone, Massimo Carlotto, Giancarlo De Cataldo, and... Tutti questi! Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> allora traduce proprio tu. But, uh, Um, please say the title of your last creation will be uh, in the bookstores here in New York uh, in July, as well like uh, Giorgio's book. What's the title? Okay. Your book. I'm sorry. You will. There's, you, your last book will come out here in New York. Se disturbiamo, mi amo via. Il tuo book, il tuo ultimo libro. Guarda che siamo un po' in giardino finché mi mette la faccia. Ah, okay, it's not yet ready. I'm sorry, sorry, my mistake. It's working. Working progress. But can you know the, 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 the title? Do you have the title already? The, uh, the, original, the, the, the original wasn't faithful to the translation. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> you said that the original was not good for the translation. Okay, okay, and last but not least, here we have the director of the Fondazione Cesare Pavese, the president of Fondazione Cesare Pavese, Luigi Cardi. Non c'è da non c'è da un microfono in battere, ma sta bene. No, we are just. Yeah, only a poor pensione. Okay. Uh, Pavese was an important writer of the last century. He wrote novels like La Luna e il Falò before we had a, a reading uh, from the beginning of La Luna e il Falò. And uh, he also was a, a very important translator. He, he translated novels by Moby Dick. So he'll explain later on about uh, uh, Pavese and the term. Okay, but now, we get, before starting to, to talk, please, uh, uh, Giorgio, Uh, join me and uh, read your the piece of your of your episode. I, I think you are so beautiful. Why do you start reading a book when, when you could spend our time together in more pleasant ways? Okay, so let's say it's not a pensiero ad alta voce. In realtà, sono quelle situazioni drammatiche di un uomo anziano. Che si illude. Ho scoperto a mie spese, non lo so tradurre in inglese e, e di conseguenza lo dico in italiano. Ho scoperto a mie spese che il famoso detto: Lo spirito è forte, ma la carne è debole, vale per tutta l'età. In questo senso, quando si è giovani si vorrebbe resistere. Mi devi dare un momento, però. <ride> ok. Pensavo che prendessero la gente capace. Per... 
<laughs> he said he, he thought they were going to take some competent people to do the translation, but uh, I had to slow him down there. I, I just can't do it uh, <laughs> word for word. Okay. When you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Dicevo, questo famoso detto, lo spirito è forte ma la carne è debole. Based on the famous expression that the, uh, the body is... Um, non so se si dice in inglese. Questo. The flesh is weak. <laughs> the flesh is weak. E... The, sp the spirit is strong. Yeah, vale per, drammaticamente per tutte le età. It's valid for all, uh, across all ages. Drammaticamente. Drammaticamente. <laughs> vale, Perché, vi spiego, quando si è giovani, quando young, si... Si perde il meglio. We forget what we're about to say. E il, quando si è giovani si vorrebbe resistere alle tentazioni, ma la carne è debole e non si riesce e si commette il peccato. When we're young we would like to resist temptation, but we're, we're unable to and we commit sin. Arrivati alla mia età, when you get to my age, lo spirito è forte nel voler peccare, the spirit, ma la the carne spirit. è debole, non ce la facciamo più. The spirit is e questo è, rende questo, questo voler di ostentare. Questo è un gesto che significa molto. Questo gesto? This gesture of putting my glasses on is very significant. When you need that? Ah, uh, ok. Tanto per dirne una, io ho qui tre, I have here three pages. Don't be scared, because it's because of the font. <laughs> I'm the one that should be scared here. Yeah. <laughs> io mi chiamo Bravo e non ho il cazzo. Questa poteva essere la mia presentazione. Il fatto di andare in giro con un soprannome invece che un nome vero e proprio non significa niente. Ognuno è quello che è, a prescindere dalle scie burocratiche che si tira presso con le stelle filanti dopo un veglione di carnevale. La mia vita non sarebbe cambiata di una virgola, qualunque nome avesse avuto da offrire insieme a una mano da strigge. Niente di più e niente di meno non una salita o una discesa, non un braccio di mare calmo o agitato dove affannarsi o di cui rimpiangere l'affanno. Non, non avere un nome era un provvido con d'ombra in cui celarsi, un volto appena intravisto, una figura appena percepita, il nulla, di nessuno. Dal momento in cui io ero quello che ero, una simile condizione racchiudeva nello specifico tutto ciò che mi serviva, senza opzioni e senza deroghe. Per quanto riguarda quell'altro particolare anatomico, vale la pena di soffermarsi un poco. Io non sono nato così. Non c'è stato sul tempo uno sguardo attonito di qualche medico che mi ha visto uscire dalla preposta fessura sguarnito di tutto punto, né un'occhiata perplessa a una madre ancora percorsa dall'ultima definitiva scossa del padre. Non ci, sono state, non ci sono state tenerezze infantili verso un bambino gravato da un handicap perlomeno singolare e suscettibile di pesanti battute negli anni a venire, o tragiche confidenze adolescenziali con il capochino e gli occhi che sembrano voler imparare a memoria la punta delle scarpe. Quando mi sono presentato al mondo tutto era al suo posto, fin troppo direi alla luce dei fatti emersi. E fino a un certo giorno, quel tutto al suo posto è stato fonte di diversi disagi per delle avventurose e avventate signore e signorine che non cercavano altro. Ho sempre pensato che quello fosse un loro problema, fino a che il problema di uno di loro è diventato il mio. Il come, il quando e il perché non saranno in futuro oggetto di esame da parte degli storici. Si è trattato semplicemente della persona sbagliata di cui accorgersi nel momento sbagliato. Reo confesso per quanto può servire, per mia stessa missione e non per mia recriminazione. L'ordine delle cose nella vita di ognuno è quello che è e basta. Talvolta non ci sono modi e motivi per comportarsi in maniera diversa, o se ci sono, nel mio caso sono stati di difficile avvistamento. Ora anche la semplice proposta di un perché sarebbe solo uno spillo in più in una bambolina voodoo che ha la mia faccia. 
una notte di quelle in cui il tempo segna un punto c'è stato qualcuno che con una affilata rama di rasoio e un bel po' di rabbia e sadismo mi ha messo nella condizione attuale mi ha lasciato steso a terra con una macchia di sangue ad allargarsi sui pantaloni in bocca una voce sempre più rotta un soffio mano a mano che la macchia diventava un grido sono stato cacciato dal teatro e sono stato costretto a passare dal palco alla scicchiera degli spettatori scaraventato nell'ultima fila direi Eppure il dolore di quel taglio non è stato niente in confronto al dolore dell'applauso. Fino all'allora avevo parlato per convenienza di amore e praticato per piacere personale il sesso. Ora mi trovavo nella condizione di non essere più costretto a promettere quell'amore perché non ero più in grado di ricevere in cambio il suo corrispettivo monetario, il sesso appunto. Il corpo di un uomo non mi diceva nulla e io non avevo nulla da proporre dal corpo di una donna. A sorpresa è subentrata la quiete niente più salito discese solo pianura niente più mare calmo o agitato solo la beffa della bonaccia quella che non gonfia e non straccia le vele adesso che non c'era più ragione di correre avevo modo di guardarmi intorno e vedere come girava davvero il mondo amore e sesso bugie e illusioni un attimo dell'uno e un attimo dell'altro e poi via alla ricerca del prossimo scalo, del prossimo indirizzo appuntato nella mente con mezzi di fortuna, a naso, a fiuto, a tentoni, ciechi, sordi e muti con il solo ausilio del tatto e dell'olfatto, l'ultima frontiera dell'istinto. Quando ho riacquistato la vista, l'udito e la parola, ho riflettuto e ho capito. Subito dopo ho accettato, nel tratto immediatamente successivo ho agito. Da allora è stato versato del sangue, materia prima di poco valore in qualunque parte del mondo. Delle persone sono morte e forse valevano meno ancora. Alcuni dei responsabili hanno pagato, altri l'hanno fatta franca. Come tutte le cose che hanno una fine nella morte, anche questa ha avuto il suo piccolo inizio. Tutto è cominciato quando ho capito che c'erano delle donne disposte a vendere il proprio corpo per avere del denaro. E quando mi sono reso conto che c'erano uomini disposti a spendere il proprio denaro pur di avere quel corpo, ci vogliono a vita rancore o cinismo per essere nel mezzo di questo scambio. Io li avevo tutti e tre. Now Anthony will read the English version. Wow, this is... Portate una sciacqua a freddo, lo so. I'm Bravo, and I don't have a tick. That could be my introduction. It doesn't change a thing that I go through life with a nickname instead of an official first and last name. You are who you are, whatever the bureaucratic trails that follow in your wake, like streamers from a carnival. My life wouldn't have been any better or worse, whatever name I gave with each handshake. The waves no higher or lower, the water just as choppy, the winds just as rough, the voyage every bit as daunting. Regret would be pointless. Being nameless just gave me an extra layer of shadow in which I could cloak myself. The fleeting glimpse of a face, a faint silhouette. Nothing there, no one. I was what I was, so namelessness was exactly what I needed. Why add a clause or a rider? As for that other anatomical detail, it's worth devoting a little time to the subject. I wasn't born this way. It's not like some doctor presiding over my birth stared in disbelief at my blank infant groin as I emerged from the maternal fissure completely unequipped for life's principal task, or cast a baffled glance at my mother as she lay there, exhausted from the last grunting effort of giving birth. There was no doting sympathy for a child growing up with the burden of a distinctive handicap, distinctive to say the least, a handicap likely to draw cruel mockery in the years to come. No tragic adolescence confessions, head bowed, gaze riveted on my shoes as if I were trying to read some higher meaning into my shoelaces. No, when I came into the world, I had all the right equipment with everything in its place. Oh, I was equipped all right, perhaps over-equipped in light of what happened later. Until things changed so radically one fine day, 
My equipment was the cause of plenty of trouble for a variety of adventuresome and reckless young and not so young ladies who wanted nothing more in life. I always figured that was their problem, not mine, until the day that one young lady's problem became my problem. The how and the when and the why of the matter would never be subjected to the scrutiny of future historians. It was a simple case of the wrong person noticing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Guilty as charged, for whatever that's worth. I make a full admission, though I have no regrets. Our lives are what they are, and nothing more. Sometimes there's just no way and no reason to act any differently. Or if there was, I was oblivious to it. Now, even the mere suggestion of a reason or motive would be just one more pin in a voodoo doll with my face on it. One night, one of those turning points when your life changes course, someone was waiting for me with a well-honed straight razor and a deep well of rage and sadism ready to make me what I am today. He left me flat on my back with a blood stain spreading across my trousers. My voice waned to a whisper as the blossoming stained in my screaming for me. I was tossed out of the theater, kicked off the stage and into the audience, hurled back into the farthest row of seats, I'd say. And yet the pain of that cut was nothing compared to the pain of the applause. Until that day, I had paid lip service to love and enjoyed sex for my own personal pleasure. Now, my condition, condition meant I was no longer obliged to promise that love because I was no longer capable of receiving its monetary equivalent in exchange, that is to say, sex. A man's body held no appeal for me, and I no longer had anything to offer a woman. Suddenly, peace reigned supreme. No more ups. No more downs, just flat land, stretching out. No more placid waters or stormy seas. Just the mocking irony of dead calm, the doldrums where sails neither belly nor rip. Now that I had no need to run, I had a chance to look around me and see how the world really works. Love and sex, lies and illusions. A moment of one, a moment of the other, then off in search of the next stop, the next address jotted down with whatever comes to hand. Following your nose, your instincts, feeling your way. Blind, deaf, and mute, relying on a sense of touch and smell, the far reaches of instinct. When I regained my sense of sight, my hearing, the ability to speak, I thought it over, and I understood. I immediately accepted. In the time that followed, I acted. Since then, blood has been shed. A raw material becomes cheap everywhere around the world. People have died, and perhaps they were worth even less than the blood that was spilled. Some of those responsible for what was done to me have paid. Others have gotten off scot-free. Like everything that culminates in death, this too started out small. It all began when I realized that there were women willing to sell their bodies for cash, and there were men willing to spend their money to get their hands on those bodies. It takes a healthy dose of greed or resentment or cynicism to work your way into the middle of that transaction. And I had all three. Di fatti stavo pensando che il prossimo libro lo faccio scrivere a lui e poi lo traduco e basta. Mi pare che sono già tutti convinti che faccia così perché io non faccio che ratificare il pensiero abbastanza difficile. No, ma no, c'è stato qualche mala lingua che se sì, io trovassi qualcuno che scrive i libri li fa firmare a me, io sto alle Bahamas tutto l'anno e allora gli mando cartelline beffa ai miei amici. He's going to get Anthony to sign his books for him and possibly even write his uh, future novels, and then he's going to do the translation into Italian. That was some of that. Did you have any problem with uh, the Pimp's Note? I mean, what was the problem? Are you still friends? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. We're still friends. There was some problem related to some battles that, inevitably, I've put nel romanzo perché l'umorismo fa parte della, della mia natura. The only problem we had was with a few of the jokes because uh, humor is obviously a fundamental part of what I do and. Interesting. I don't yeah. have a sense of humor. <laughs> no, no, 
non si inverni, cioè, sto dicendo che purtroppo c'era una battuta che era un gioco di parole fra l'italiano e il latino che era inter assolutamente intraducibile perché in queste figure da un punto di vista legale e nel mondo anglosassone, nel diritto anglosassone non esistono. There was one uh, joke which was a play on words between uh, Italian versus Latin which was fundamentally untranslatable. You're and, going to and tell as us. a translator, may I point out that it involved a pope calling a crusade and a will. Yeah, allora abbiamo fatto, <laughs> quando c'è un qualche <laughs> problema abbiamo fatto una cosa. Come la traduciamo? Risposta, non la traduciamo, la tagliamo. <laughs> the, just, the decision in the end was how do we translate this? Don't know how to do it, let's just cut it out. <laughs> Secondo una regola abbastanza attendibile che se una frase può essere tagliata e non se ne accorge nessuno vuol dire che per il romanzo non è vero. Following the fairly basic rule in literature that if you can uh, take out a sentence without it uh, being noticed then, then do it. Sì, sì. Cazzo. Mi scriveva delle email ma c'è questa cosa taglia. Il libro si è, con questo modo di procedere, il libro si è ridotto di circa 200 pagine. <laughs> With this we managed to bring the book down to maybe 200 pages. Il che significa che io sostanzialmente ho un talento straordinario nello scrivere i folders. Cioè, <laughs> <laughs> my skill became uh, writing um, folder titles. <laughs> Before leaving the microphone to the uh, Fondazione Cesare Pavese uh, and tell us uh, uh, how is, uh, what, che cos'è la traduzione per, please, uh, uh, Anthony, tell us something about uh, translation. You did study translation at university? No, no. Uh, tell I actually, well, my, my, my personal history is that I uh, uh, did study Italian. I moved to Italy and I found a job i was studying at the uh, university for Estranieri, the, wow. the beautifully named University for, university for Foreigners yeah, in no. Perugia. In Perugia. Yeah. And um, this was in the late 1970s. This was around the time of the novel. And um, um, I was informed that there was a job available and I wanted to work in Italy and not go back to the United States. Um, and I wound up in the town of Cuneo which is a joke all by itself, right? But it's on Roma di Mondo. And um, where I translated, um, I, we sent out translations by Telex. It was amazing. There were three people in a, in a little room typing into these machines with these strips of yellow paper that came out. And every time that the paper would tear, you would hear people screaming. And then they'd try to tape it back together, punch little holes in it. That was what they had before. Di solito quando uno vuole stare in Italia e non vuole tornare negli Stati Uniti c'è di mezzo una donna, 99 su 100. La cultura non c'entra granché. Usually it's a mia personale esperienza, supposizione. My personal experience is that if somebody ends up staying in Italy um, rather than going back to the United States, there's usually a woman involved somewhere. Um, but I am also a writer. It's a lot better business to translate <laughs> these days, but I mean, not if you're Georgia for but I don't, <laughs> I don't translate, sorry. I can't translate, and that's right. Non ho mai provato a tradurre, ma è una cosa, in, potrebbe essere una cosa interessante. Per adesso faccio ancora fatica a tradurre i libretti di istruzioni elettrodomestici. I, I thought about having a go at translating myself and could be an interesting uh, path for me, but uh, for now I have enough difficulty translating the instruction books from the electronic stuff that I buy. Um, we have a question from the We have here Lapina. Ciao, no, volevo sapere come vi siete scelti, nel senso se hai scelto te lui, se te lo hanno imposto, perché immagino che affidare una propria, una propria 
creatura alle mani di qualcun altro, nel senso sia una cosa delicata, no? Essere tradotti è, è, una, è, una, è una, un gesto di intimità forte nei confronti di un'altra persona. How does the translator and the writer come together? Uh, how does a, a writer choose a translator? Allora, ci sono indubbiamente nella vita dei momenti di sfiga. <laughs> Perché la nostra è stata contemporanea, a me è toccato lui e a lui sono toccato io. Everyone has uh, unfortunate moments in their life and uh, there's no doubt that uh, we both uh, had a moment of misfortune in meeting each other. <laughs> Mi piace misfortune, è molto una misfortune, sembra... Un, sembra una sfortuna ta talmente grossa da avere con la, con la fascia da Miss. <ride> miss Fortune. Basta staccare le due parole e con cambia completamente il senso. He uh, likes the use of the word Miss Fortune and thinks that that could be uh, written on a, a, a strip across somebody's chest. Se, se qualcuno fra di voi si stupisce che io in passato abbia guadagnato del denaro dicendo stronzate come queste sappia che il primo a stupirsi sono io ma se ci sono qualcuno di voi che si amazzano o curiosi del fatto che potrei aver guadagnato il denaro di essere qui e di parlare di bullshit vorrei dire che il più sorpreso di tutti è io e io actually feel i think this is kind of appropriate to Giorgio Folletti. Um, in movies that are set during the war years, there's a kind of a standard uh, trope. What, what happens is the police come and they pull a counterfeit out of jail or a safe cracker, and they say, we need you. We are at, the Germans are going to blow up Michelangelo's David. You need to falsify some documents, or you need to break into this safe. And all of a sudden, a person who's a, who's a criminal and who performs things that are punished by the police finds himself working for the good of the community. Similarly, when they brought Giorgio's novel to me. Dato che non ho capito niente, prima di dire che sono d'accordo, voglio sentire il mio avvocato. Since I didn't actually understand a word of that, before I answer, I'd like to first refer to my lawyer. As a writer, the, uh, for a writer, the, the first commandment is thou shalt not plagiarize. And yet one of the best publishers in the United States came to me and gave me a contract and money and a book and said, copy this. Mm, yeah, you can ask. <laughs> no. Um, it was, I did it for the love. I did it for the love of the book. But it's like they brought me a kit with, a, with the beautiful, dangerous women, the cruel senator, the ruthless terrorists, the, the tricky blind man, and they said, here, here's all the parts, put it together. And I did, and it was a lot of fun. Quando vedi gli occhi che diventano grossi miei, vuol dire che non sto capendo niente. E allora rallenta un po'. If you, if you see my eyes go red, it's the, it's the bit where I don't understand a word you're saying, so please slow down a bit. And, no, c'è una cosa che volevo dire, che ho notato durante la lettura, ad esempio c'è un, un passaggio che io ho sentito della traduzione, dove la traduzione è addirittura meglio di quello che ho scritto io. There's a bit that I'd just like to point out that I listened during the, the reading, and there's, a, there's actually a part where the translation becomes better than my original. And it upset me just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's a compliment. It's a very good compliment. Thank you very much. No, ma a parte questo, io credo che un, un traduttore sia un, una persona che oltre a, a entrare nello spirito dell'autore che traduce, deve avere anche un senso comune eh, del linguaggio che spazia fra due culture differenti, cioè deve trasportare il senso di un significato in, in, in una frase che abbia lo stesso significato ma in un modo formale completamente differente. Questo credo che è veramente un lavoro straordinario.
the skill of a translator lies not only in translating the, the simple words of the, of the original, but to actually um, have a, a kind of dance between the two languages and the two cultures and, and, and end with, a, with an interpretation that, that goes beyond the simple kind of word-for-word -word translation and, and translates you know, culturally as well as, as, well as word-for-word. But now, uh, Mr. President of Fondazione Cesare Pavese, let's go back from the present to the past, from Cesare Pavese. Cesare Pavese was really a great translator. He translated books like Moby Dick, for example, bestsellers. So what do you think about this? Hello. Can you translate? Sure. Perché Cesare Pavese? Why? Why Cesare Pavese? <laughs> What about Cesare Pavese and cosa uh, c'entra Cesare Pavese con la traduzione? Where does Cesare Pavese come into translation? Yes. Okay. What's he got to do with translation? I, I have to read, but I, I explain. When uh, Cesare Pavese uh, was a young student, he developed a great passion for American literature. He graduated with uh, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman a collection of poetry. So Pavese was inspired to create a new language, more simple, free and creative, as well as the American slang. In Italy at that time, uh, the language was influenced by fascism and its authoritarian and intolerant rhetoric. Pavese was an is innovator and he understood the Italian language was changing because Italy was changing. Agriculture economy was becoming industrial. So a new way of communication was needed. American language and literature were the model Pavese used to start a linguistic experimentation. And uh, why American slang? Because Pavese began his career working as a translator. His first translator translation was uh, Our Mr. Brand by Sinclair Lewis, and later Moby Dick by Melville, that became his masterpiece. Lewis was the most important writer in American slang. Pavese called him, uh, and now I need your translation, I read in Italian, Il più indiavolato a cavarne effetti d'arte. We discussed this earlier, and uh, we we came with a um, with a translation that the um, the, uh, the 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 most obsessed uh, provocateur of artistic effect. Okay. American language is <laughs> I can I can show you my survival English. <laughs> Much fun that uh, in tomorrow morning. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Just finished. American language. <laughs> from Piemonte. <laughs> That's amazing. It, uh, it might remember me in the, in the beginning of my career, in the way I started um, acting, you know, I was a, a, a kind of stand-up comedian. And one of my, my sketches was to sing uh, the Bob Dylan song, uh, Blowing in the Wind, with a, a, an accent. Yeah. That sound that oh man, it rot must have been. And uh, it's my my teeth. You know, it's my work. It's a new. We are the same. We are the same. We are the same. We are the same. We come from the same area, same region. No. Marorito. It's a small village in, in which one of my parents has used to move. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, I was so young. <laughs> thank you. Oh. No, thank you. The language is for Paris, eh? a way to discover the power of Italian language, to create its own language, and to write its novels that uh, seems linked to dialect. This language was, uh, as American language, rich of writers and deep meanings. In conclusion, for Pavese to be a translator meant to be a writer. And he creates some of the most beautiful and important translation that still nowadays we can all read. Moby Dick, translated by Pavese, becomes a new novel, taught by an Italian man with his art seduced by America, its language and its culture. Now, I, I would like to quote Pavese, and I need a translator because the real meaning could be lost in my translation. Ci sono due generi di traduzione. There are two types of translation. Come scrisse Pavese. As written by Pavese. In una lettera dell'aprile del 1931. In a letter of April 1931. Uno, quello da me scelto. One is my way of translating. L'altro, il metodo scientifico. The other, the scientific method. E allora l'ideale è, senza mezzi termini, and therefore, uh, ideally, uh, mm. uh, directly. La versione interlineare che serva agli studentini. The word-for-word -word version, uh, which is uh, used by and, uh, and done for students. Okay. And another quote, the practice of translation is a second creation. And he added, uh, I made my choice. I loved it. I was attracted by America not a simple undertaking. Well, now I have a surprise for you. <laughs> not, a gift, not a gift. I want to show you the first original edition of Moby Dick, translated by Cesare Pavese in 1939. This copy belonged to the writer and he gave it as a present to his friend Giuseppe Scaglione, called Nuto, in the moon and the bonfire. You can see the dedication on the front page. this um, original uh, the dedication at the front says to Pinole is signed by Cesare Pavese and is dated the 10th of July 1932 yeah it's an honor for the uh, Casa Zerini Marimo and for Imo Festival ever. I credo fosse per me maybe fantastic in fashion in the front Page in the front pages inside the front pages is um, a, a, a dried four-leaf clover, which was uh, presented, which was presented by Cesare Pavese in the, that he gave together with the book and the and the dedication. I would like to, to thank all of you and, and George, I think you can be proud that we are proud to have you and Pavese together. You're not in a bad company. Yeah, so, so we, we, it's an honor to meet you. <laughs> and as we, 
it was discussed earlier. Yes, Cesare Pavese would have loved very much to come to the States and in particular to come to New York. Uh, he applied uh, for a PhD program in a university that I will not mention that is located uptown. <laughs> and he was rejected. Uh, mostly for, apparently, for political reasons. Uh, you know, that politics plays a big role sometimes, unfortunately, in universities. Um, so he didn't make it. And that was for him a source of great uh, sadness. He would have really loved to come to a great university in America and get his PhD here. It didn't happen. And therefore, is one more reason for us to be very happy that the Fondazione Pavese somehow brought him to another great American university downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great source of pride and honor for us to give this little vindication uh, to a great Italian writer. And thanks again to Giorgio Folletti for being here with us. My and pleasure. Good luck. Absolutely. Good luck in your work. Good job, Anthony. Grazie, Sergio. Thank you all very much. We'll take our friend of MFR waiting for us upstairs for a reception to celebrate the winners of the competition and uh, Giorgio Valenti. Thank you again. But before we have a presentation for you, Fondazione Cesare Novese, I'm sorry. Yes, sí, we have a present for you because non possiamo darvi il libro ma questo ve lo possiamo dare un, noi abbiamo fatto fare nel 2010 la penna dello scrittore attraverso l'Aurora che è una delle migliori case di produzione di penne italiane abbiamo rifatto la penna dello scrittore so uh, uh, what, the one I've created here is a, is a replica of Cesare Pavese's original pen uh, created by the fondazione Cesare Pavese as a limited edition pen um, that they'd like to present now. Se non vuoi aprire una così lo vediamo. Ah, that's amazing, that's my memory. E porta la firma dello scrittore, la firma originale dello scrittore has Cesare Pavese's signature that's, inscribed on the side of the pen. That's amazing, because... No, no, I mean, there's something, really, there's something really tender, because when I, was, when I was a kid, and I was at school, there were too many, the, the two important brands uh, of uh, pen makers were Aurora, this one and Pelican. And the, 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 the classroom was divided between Pelicanists and Aurorists, you know? So, and I was an Aurorist. I had my Aurora in Thailand. That, that reminds me that. It's, it's amazing. I prefer a, a check of $100 million, but... No, it's, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A real gift, I can say. That one more time. <laughs> no, just, just the, 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 the chance you have in my hands, uh, something that uh, has been in the hands of Cesare Pogliazzi. Just to try to, you know, to, uh, something. Go, mm. The clover, maybe. Yeah, I have already my hand. So, yeah, now we can go and uh, enjoy the... Yeah. Thank you very much. Just Thank you.